So I'll be exploring that, but also the, the extra fun part is we're going to be making games today as well. That's why I've brought all this stuff. I hope you all had breakfast, because there's nothing in here. Because um, one of my things that I do with my board game design, let's get these, probably hard to see online, but all my games are made sustainably, so they're using recycled materials and printed and produced locally. So today, when we make our games, we're using a whole bunch of recycled materials that I've brought down, um, all sorts of things, and we're going to create games out of them. Um, and this is the same sort of thing I do with kids all the time. Um, it includes some of my old frog boxes, which I'll, talk, I'll give you a story about later. This is, this is how we learn how not to stuff up the printing. All right, cool. So let's, let's move onwards. Perfect. So who am I? That's a good question. Um, so I'm Jake or Dapper Cranium Studios. So that's the, the business I run everything under. Um, I'm a game designer and enthusiast. When all the kids at, you know, three, four, five, whatever, were saying, I want to be a fireman or a policeman, whatever. I was saying, I want to be a game designer. So I was that kid sitting there in the corner drawing silly little mazes and getting my friends to play test them for me. Um, but I also like playing games. I don't just make them. I play them as well. Um, ooh. It's hard to pick a few favorites, but I quite like my Metroidvanias. Who knows Metroidvania here? Yeah, Metroidvania genre. It's a little bit alternative. Yeah, good a few hands. Excellent. Um, like a good action RPG, that sort of stuff. Um, but I also quite like board games. So I'll get into some of that board game stuff later, but the thing, about, the thing I really like about board games is the accessibility of them. One person gets the game and then everyone can play around the table. Um, and with you know, COVID kind of quieting down, we can get some more board games out there, which is excellent. Um, I'm also an artist. So a lot of the game, well, all my games, I do all the art for. Um, I won't give you the full story, but back in 2017, I taught myself art by sitting down and drawing something every day. Um, that was about building confidence, and sometimes building confidence in your skills is the first step to actually doing something with them. Um, I'm also a writer, so I've got a novel I'm working on. We can talk about that later if you really want to. Um, I'm also launching a book today, um, which is all about my board game design workshops, um, and it's basically a, I call it a guide, because it's not a full book. It's pretty short, but it's filled with fun little pictures and all sorts of little tidbits that I've learned from my journey in approachable game design. So it doesn't go into all the big complex stuff. It tries to make it nice and easy to approach for everyone. Even if you're deep into your own design, this might give you some ideas on how to do it. But anyway, I didn't want today's workshop to be all about me promoting my book. Um, I'm also an educator, and that's another reason why I'm up here. Um, because I'm a teacher, I'm a educator. I talk to kids and I try and help them discover their own path. So there's a term in teaching or education called guide on the side. Uh, and I, what I really like about game design is it's very big project-based, inquiry-based learning, which you can help a kid or a student or whatever follow that journey by themselves and just be their guide on the side, rather than giving them a worksheet and expecting them to do it or throwing them a whole bunch of homework. It's an outdated system and, yeah. I won't get into my qualms about the education system. Alrighty, so, plan for today. We're, uh, we're doing our 15 minute chat about game dev now. Gonna keep it relatively quick, because um, I wanna, want you guys to get into the fun parts, which is 30 minutes initial planning and brainstorming. Now, quick back step. This is how I run my game dev delves, or the workshops. We'll do a little bit of this and a little bit of chatter. It's gonna be quite freeform today. Um, I want to make sure everyone has a chance to build something today collaboratively with the other people in the room or amongst your own little groups or by yourself or whatever you want. Um, I've brought lots of things for you to use today, not only as references but also as the recycled materials down here, which will be a little hard for people online, but see how you go. Maybe you can find something on your desk or wherever you're set up and work on that one. Um, yeah, so 30 minutes initial playing and brainstorming and then 45 minutes of playing games. So. Try not to skip too far ahead, but an artist can't draw a tree if they've never seen a tree, right? Can we all agree on that? Can a game designer be expected to make a game if they've never played a game? Yeah? Yeah? I've never played a game before. Can I make a game? Maybe, but it's probably not going to make much sense. So part of today is I want to play some games, but not just play some games, but play them with a critical eye. Really analyze each aspect of the game. Think about what makes it fun and why we enjoy it. Because that's, oh, no, I, I, it's all right. That's a later, later slide. Um, cool. And then we'll have a bit of time to build our games as well. 
which will include a bit of me rambling as well. I hope you are all right with me rambling, because that's I assume that's why you're here. Um, cool. So why games for education? Engaging, right? Games are engaging. Kids like to play games. That's I th I'm sure we can all agree on that. People like to play games. We like to play games. Um, and at the moment, they are often a distraction. But we can repurpose them. So, for example, one of my games is called Bin Off. This teaches recycling education through a game very vaguely similar to Uno. It started out as Uno. It evolved since then. But I'll get into that process later. We can make games like these that are not just educational, because I'm sure you've all seen an educational game before. It needs to be fun as well. So it actually properly engages people in the topic. Um, Project-based learning, I went through that. Um, so multimodal learning, so that's all about lots of different aspects. You can learn lots of different things on this big project on the game. Because, of course, someone has to do the art, someone has to design, someone has to do the writing. There's lots of things to work on in making a game, so there's lots of things to learn about it. Um, so learn from making. And, yeah, cool, I already went through all of that. Marvelous. Okay, so you want to make a game, right? That's why we're here. We're game designers or game enthusiasts. Put your hand up if you're a game designer. Yeah? Put your hand up, hand up if you like games. Excellent. Cool. Good. All right. So who likes being creative? Yes. Okay. Um, and making interactive experiences for your friends. Who likes doing that? A little bit of the bigger word one. but. Um, and lastly, you have a story to tell, and writing it down and drawing it isn't enough. I love art, I love writing, but sometimes you can, you can tell a really elaborate, multi-dimensional story through a game. We all know this, we've all played, well, who's played, example, who's played Skyrim? Yeah, cool. You can choose your own story through that sort of game. I chose something basic, because most people have probably played that one. Um, and that's the thing about games. It's an interactive story that you can learn from it. I'm speaking to the converter here, you know what I'm talking about. Cool, okay. So here's the big question. Games are meant to be fun. Can we agree on that? Games are meant to be fun? I'm just getting you to uh, put up hands here. Are games meant to be fun? Yes. yes. But what is fun? I don't know what fun is. Someone tell me what fun is. Please, I'm... I'm what was that, sorry? Oh, good. That's, that's one of the best questions I've had. <laughs> best answers I've had. Um, okay. It's intrinsic desire to do something. Anyone else? What is fun? Yeah, you're having, you're, having, you're having fun, right? You're enjoying your, you want to do this, an intrinsic desire. It's, it's, it's hard to define this stuff, but in terms of games, this is what I've ended up with. Oh, I jumped too far ahead. Let's go, bleh. cool. So, what I think is fun in games is the challenge, because a game that's too easy, it's re it's don't really doesn't really challenge you, it may as well be a book or something that is straightforward, it's as expected, it doesn't, it doesn't have that level of interactivity. Um, it leads into player interaction. If you have a board game, you're all sitting around interacting with each other, right? If your board game just has you playing a card down and not really saying anything to anybody else, or you know, you're not stealing a card from somebody, or moving tokens around, then, it, then the interaction is really low, and then again, it's not really a game, is it? Board interaction. One of the greatest things I like about board games is fun little tactile experiences. And this is one of my examples. It's not a particularly comp oh, sorry, a bit of explosive there. Um, it's not a particularly complex example. There's some really great board games out there that have all sorts of cool things going on. But I really like gizmos. Has anyone played gizmos here? Oh, OK. That's, oh, was there one at the back? No. <laughs> um, so gizmos, you have marbles. And you roll marbles down a little chute. And you collect them as if they were like energy or something like that. So really, it's quite a simple game, but it's tactile. You're picking up marbles, you're moving them around, you're using them similar to tokens, um, and it also has cards that link up and show. It's a very visual game. When we play games, we'll get a chance to look at it. But this is one of the things about board interaction that is another thing that makes games fun. Um, and actually, I didn't even look at Who's played hand-to-hand -hand Wombat before? I like the smiles, though. Um, so that one has, it has these big blocks that you have to actually use to build stuff but you build it while blindfolded. So more sort of interaction. And that's another kind of player interaction, because you're sitting there awkwardly touching, awkwardly touching hands throughout the whole thing. Um, interesting, unique art. Now, this is one of my, my personal favorites, because some games, I won't engage with the, the challenge or anything, because it's a bit too, I like a simple game. Um, and sometimes the challenge or something else 
doesn't, doesn't gel with me, but I just sit there and look at the pretty colors and the pretty art. And I think that's, that's another aspect of games that can make it really fun. I mean, who likes going to an art gallery? Yeah? So it's kind of similar. If you have a big hand of cards and they've all got really cool art on them, it's like you've got your own little mini art gallery in your hand. And that, I think that's pretty cool. Now, these two are really important, accessibility and inclusivity. So I mentioned a bit before about board games, how every, one person could buy it and everyone can sit around the table. Um, accessibility covers that. It also covers simplistic approach to the gameplay. So uh, I should have gotten this out earlier. Yeah, that's all right. I won't get it out now. Um, my game, Frodge, it fits into... Actually, you know, I will get it out. It's easier to explain if I can show it. This is my game, Frodge. This is what it started out as a Kickstarter a few years ago. The rule book is hidden somewhere behind all the little frogs. The rule book is this big. Do you think that's an accessible game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's not much to learn to get into the game. So you can bring it to a party, hand this rule book to someone, and they spend you know, a minute reading and they're ready to play the game. So that's what I believe is an accessible game because it's easy to get into. You can take it to any group of friends um, and you can play it in any sort of situation. Um, so that's what I think is another thing, thing about fun. That being said, there are complex games that are also ex like a lot of fun. I like a good complex game. I played Dungeon Dragons for 10, probably I still am playing it somewhat. Um, that game can be vastly complex, as complex as the players wanted to make it. Um, and that's where inclusivity comes in, because there are lots of different kinds of players in the world and everyone wants to try something different and they don't all want to be boxed into a really small game. I love Frodge. It's a simple game and not for everybody. Um, I made an expansion to try and make it a little bit more, tap into more of those inclusivity aspects, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you make a simple game, it will always be relatively simple. Except the, the easy to learn, hard to master thing. Has anyone heard of that term before? few of you, yeah, excellent. So some games tap into that really well. Frodge approaches it, but not as much as I'd like it to. Um, I won't talk about this too much, but is anyone going to Perth Games Festival at the end of the week? Yeah. Woo! So I'm going to be bringing the prototype of my really complex sci-fi Metroidvania board game there. So if anyone would like to play that, which I've been working on for six years, because I can't get it right, but I want to make that a nice complex game with lots of cool stuff going on. And that's for the inclusivity stuff, because I want to make a game that the people who really want to sink their teeth into a game, they can get into that one. Cool. Okay. So now I'm going to go back. And I've kind of already gone through some of this. But yeah, the fun behind Frodge, it's simple and easy to learn. Game time is short. The gameplay usually goes for 20 minutes max, uh, unless, unless you're playing the team version, which last time I played that went for an hour. Um, cute frogs. I like frogs. Who likes frogs? Yeah, cool. Frogs. Excellent. Frogs. <laughs> That's why I made Frog. I like frogs. Um, uh, strategy for all ages. So I didn't design it as a kid's game. I designed it as a family game. And there is an important distinction because a kid's game is... Did I bring it today? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, a kid's game is something that has a very short rule book and can be very easy to get into. And sometimes the parents will begrudgingly play it with the kids and kind of like, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just rolling a dice over and over again. And I'm making no challenging decision decisions. Um, strategy for all ages is there are aspects that the older people can really get into. Um, what do I say? How do I say it? It's rules easy enough for the kids to understand, but complex enough so the parents don't get bored. Um, that's my nice little marketing line for that one. Um, oh, and we've got the gotcha mechanic. So who do you think, what, what do you think I mean by a gotcha mechanic? Someone throw something at me. What is a gotcha mechanic? Exactly, that was the example I was going to use as well. Perfect, you stole it from my mouth. Perfect. Um, so it's something where you're sitting around the table and say, ah, gotcha. So in Frodge, the entire game is based around that. You're moving tiles around. You'll get a chance to play this later. I've got play copies and all that sort of stuff. Um, and online, yeah, hopefully with video, you can have a look at it. Cool, moving on, bin off. A lot of the same kind of design concepts. Um, okay, this is a dumb one. Who likes Pokemon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I designed bin off loosely off the idea behind Pokemon, where there's lots of different characters. You can really get into them and really like them as a design. Um, rather than magical beasts, each item or each character in the game is an item of rubbish. So it's trying to characterize the rubbish to get kids to really, ap not appreciate a piece of rubbish, but appreciate the character, the world, the design, and then link that to something in the real world that hopefully will 
teach them something. Um, Spin-off has multiple difficulties for multiple audiences. I'm just pulling apart all my little, these are my play copies, that's why they're always falling apart. First half of the rule book is for the simplistic play, that's a really easy one. Second half adds a whole bunch more rules if you want to play with them. They're not required for the base game, but that's tapping into that inclusivity thing as well, and yeah, it means more people can play it and more people can try it out. If they want to do the simple version, that's fine. If they want to level up their game, then that's available as well. Um, and a well-designed board game will have those different notes they can hit, I guess. Um, same thing, plenty of player interaction and gotcha mechanics. For example, in Binoff, there's an icon or a, a card you can use in this more complex version called the Contaminant card. Um, in real world recycling, if you have stained cardboard boxes, like a pizza box, if you put it in your yellow recycling, it contaminates it and then everything else can't actually be recycled properly because you've put gross pizza stuff all over it. You can do that in the game. You can get, as an example, you can get, you can get the old animal waste, the dog poop, and you can put that on someone else's bin and destroy their bin, which is very rude, but it is a gotcha mechanic, which is a gameplay mechanic, so people can have fun with it, but it also has learning to it. Okay. Uh, and I went through Bounty burglars a, burglars a little bit. This is my sci-fi one. Um, and this is me trying to get the inclusivity of uh, more complex games. Um, and yeah, there we go. There's easy to learn, hard to master. Okay, so what is fun? Okay, I've talked for too long now because I want to get into some of the, the design aspects. So getting you guys to design something. Um, and this is what I call, which I haven't put in the title, but I call my inspiration engine. So when I do this with kids, I ask them, what's your favorite activity, animal, or food? Someone, give me a favorite activity. Be it a sport, or we can't say games, that's too obvious. <laughs> hockey, thank you. Okay, how can you make a game out of hockey? So you've got the, the stick, you're hitting the ball, you're getting points. As you design the game, you can have a think about all the different aspects of your favorite activity. Um, and you can move to animal, well, you can do it, choose animal or food, but if you're sticking with activity, you can think about all the aspects inside that um, and where that could fit into a game world. In this earlier set, it's just about brainstorming. We just want the kids to kind of dot, jot down a few different things um, because the next stage, the, the play tech or the game researching stage is where more of this thought inspiration comes from. Um, so you can also choose animal or food. I guess with my example with animal, I thought frogs. Frogs jump along ponds. They go from one end to the other. So it was pretty basic thought, pro thought line. I can't remember what you call it. Um, to s make it a racing game because you go from one end to the other. Um, and then from there, it was just about jumping on little lily pads. Here's a fun fact. I, and a fun fact about research. I was playing Minecraft with friends the night before I came up with Frog, and I discovered you could step on lily pads with, uh, in Minecraft. And for some reason, that gave me the idea for Frog. You never know where inspiration comes from. This is why I say play games with a critical eye. Um, I can't say I was particularly playing Minecraft with a critical eye that night, but anyway. Um, oh, and I have an example in my book about food um, where you could be playing like a gotcha mechanic inspired game where you're trying to put pineapple on everyone's pizza and they don't want you to put pineapple on their pizza. So feel free to use that idea if you'd like to make some kind of pineapple inserting pizza challenge game. Okay, so uh, actually before I get into that, do we want to break off and have a little bit of a brainstorm in groups or by yourself and just just start with your favorite one of those three, three things. Um, do a couple of brainstorming things. I'll give you maybe, how long do we want? Five, ten minutes? Five minutes? Yeah, we can keep it simple. Um, what I did forget to do is I forgot to give out paper. Ooh, it's gonna be really loud. So I'm just gonna awkwardly wander around the room and hand out some paper. Try not to rip it. There we go. So just start brainstorming. If you need some pens or pencils, I will get out my pens and pencils. Let's get some paper here. Yeah. Oh, you you got the sword anyway. Want some paper? I'll pop it here. <laughs> All right. I've got 
some of the bat. Ooh. Paper? Have you got pens back here? Writing implements of some sort? Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. How are we doing over here? Any ideas yet? Yeah, I've got, I've got an idea. I'm trying yeah. to think of the different brainstorm solutions, like activities, animals, and food. Yeah, let's just start with the basic brainstorming for now, because we, we don't want to jump too far ahead too quickly. So just pick a favorite thing. I mean, this is what I go through with the kids, but we'll go through it with the kids today as well. Are you a game designer or a teacher? Or? Uh, designer, I guess. Okay. I'm trying to get into the Oh, cool. Perfect. Yo. I'm posting about to put a Zoom meeting half an hour oh, on, right. so I'm going to jump out, but I will be back. Oh, no worries. Michelle, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, of course. Cool. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, you too. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah all good. It's good yeah. starting to go, yeah. So I'll miss a bit of the debate and I'll be back for the it, it, it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, this is good. Awesome. It's a process, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's all, it's all simple stuff at the moment. Don't think too hard about how the game's going to look. Just yeah. not jot down things that you think might fit into a game. And do the pillows cost like sleep points or do you have money to spend? Or? Sorry, I'm jumping too far ahead. We're just thinking about the basic. Is this like a sleep game? Yeah, we're competing yeah. who can get the best rest night. Oh, okay. We have to like sabotage each other. Oh, I love this. This is great. This can be educational as well. If you get the best rest, you get more points and then you can spend those on other things. Maybe. Ah, over a week. Yeah, maybe you play it over a week. You're jumping ahead already because when I get to my four pillars, we talk about like what a turn looks like, and then there we go. Each day is a different turn, and then you play the game over a whole week. And anyway, yeah. <laughs> Not keen on the sleep one. Well, one of the cards, because one of the one of the things. I'm here more for moral support than interest, but I, I'm, oh, I, I'm enjoying your talk. It's lots of um, interesting information. Cool. You know, I mean, I, I analyse games as well. Mm -hmm. I have completely different ideas, but I, I still look at the motivation and the, what people are interested in. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm not really developing a game, I'm developing a framework. But mm. yeah. Yeah, oh, it's, there, are, there are lots of different approaches to it, and yeah. mine is just one of them. Yeah, it's definitely, oh yeah. yeah. And I mean, I find it works quite well with the kids. Yeah, it's always a bit slow. It's It's crucial. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, this is... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it really gets the critical mind, mind thinking. You know, strategy, interaction. And this, like the player interaction, is like the more player interaction has, not only is it more fun, it's more education because learning people manager. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Do we have an idea back here? Yes. <laughs> Come on, uh, do I? Oh. Do, do I have to put the hard yards um, on? Like you? watching, watching sort of online video and it's like a, the mechanic is you're trying to get out of the situation where you're just passively sitting there just streaming yeah. video. So the gotcha mechanics other players can play on you are things like you it's know, like suggested drops, videos or something? Or, yeah, like suggested oh, videos or the algorithm changes and it's more addictive or like yeah. stuff like that. I and like you're this. just trying to like get this is it. good. Well, it came from like, I was like, oh, favorite activity. Well, what if my favorite activity is something boring, like watching TV? And then that's the good. Way it's like yeah. wild, so you kind of <laughs> Well, sometimes like for some kids, they say, I don't, I don't have a favorite activity. I'm like, okay, well, choose the thing you hate the most. So yeah, it's the same thing. Like there's one of, I think. Is school. Is it normally school? Is it always school? Uh, not usually, actually. I mean, yeah. All these shows that you can gamify school quite effectively yeah. and make a very compelling game out of it. Mm, yeah. mm. Do we have anything cooking over here? Yeah. Oh, am I yeah, you don't, you don't. Uh, Who's the chef? Well, we're both 
Sheffin. <laughs> Sheffin. Oh, he just stopped so blasting the mic. So the activity was drifting, like drifting a car. Yeah, and that's what so the swirly things are there for. That's the swirly things. So cool. we <laughs> thought, because basically how competitions work is you're trying to get your car into like certain zones, and then whoever gets in the zones, you get extra points or something like that. And then the track is made of pizza. Yeah. Oh. So oh. We so and the drivers are giraffes. Oh yeah, giraffes. So we got all three. Yeah. Oh gosh. That's okay. What we wanted to come okay. Out. And then you get more points if the drift doesn't get your yeah. Do I need to add a section about scope just for you guys? No. <laughs> can I, can I give that to you? Do you guys, and you don't want to be able to move in, that way when you have discussion, people online can see there's people in there discussing. Oh, true. Yeah, yeah. I'll wander forward again. All right, I think we'll give you one more minute for that, and then we'll move on, because we've got plenty more to go on, go through. I'm excited. I might get through the whole PowerPoint this time. I don't usually get through the whole PowerPoint with the kids. We usually stop at the game plan. Just, it's just about not jotting things down for the moment. See where we go with that. All right, can I grab attention up to the front, please? It takes so much longer with the kids. All right, so looks like you've all got some basic ideas coming through. So again, that was just like a brainstorming of different aspects of whether, whether it was your favorite or least favorite activity, animal or food. Um, did anyone put down least favorite animal? I don't think so. No? Yeah, all good. Good. That's all good. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get into the real, the nitty gritty, the, 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 the meat of the burger today. Um, the four pillars of game dev. This is what I like to call it. So we start with the story. So what roles will your players take on? So you kind of have started that already by figuring out the favorite animal, activity, anything like that. That gets you set up. Um, you have your basic gameplay, so this is what a turn looks like. So this is getting into the, the core basic stuff. This is the, the really small rule book stuff. The big rule book stuff comes later because you want to get the basics worked out first. It's like you're building a house. If you don't build the frame first, the whole thing's going to sink into the swamp. Anyone? Monty Python reference? No? <laughs> oh, yeah, Shrek too works too. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, Target audience. So this is not the marketing one where you're, where you're sitting there researching marketing stuff. This is about who will, who will well. It is a little bit. But this is more about how many people are playing your game and what kind of, what demographic amongst the inclusivity thing will want to play your game. So maybe it is a bit about market research. Um, but lastly, we've got the research, and this is playing similar games and understanding why they're fun. So this is the playing games with a critical eye. Um, this is the part that we will do a bit of today. That, that's why I've got that big tantalizing wall of games there. It's probably not as big as some of your collections at home, but I can only fit so much in my car. Um, but those are some of the games which I think are a really good example of different aspects of fun. Um, I'll get into those later. I'll jump into story. Every game has a story. Even something like Uno and well, Monopoly definitely... Well, what's the, what's the story of Monopoly? Someone tell me the story of Monopoly. You're a tycoon, exactly. So that gives you creative motivation to play the game. And if your players have creative motivation, then they want to sit down at your table. They want to play your the plus four cards, or they want to take their, take their rent from somebody who landed on, is it Mayfair, the last ones? Yeah. yeah, I don't play much Monopoly. I'm not, I will admit I'm not a huge fan of Monopoly, because it's usually just rolling dice and arguing about how much something costs. And we do that anyway during life. So. Um, 
Uh, but it's all about who your players become while they're playing your game. So they know what their role is. And the reason why I asked you things like their favorite activity or animal is that means you can start with them playing as an animal. Like with Frog, you get to play as a frog. And anyone who likes flo frogs and you tell them they get to play as a frog, they're like, yes, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I want to be a frog. I don't want to be a human. I want to be a frog. Um, I've had some people get really into Frog because of that. <laughs> uh, the main goal of the characters. If you understand the main goal of your story and the characters in the story, then it can be quite easy to divert or to create the actual main goal in the gameplay itself. Frog's trying to hop along the, the pond to get the other side, get to the other side. That's what the gameplay mechanic is at the same time. Story can be synonymous with gameplay mechanics. Um, and obstacles. What obstacles are we going to face? In Frog, unfortunately, um, <laughs> oh gosh, that was a huge one. Um, I hope I didn't explode anyone's headphones at home. Just going to puff my chest out a bit. In Frog, for some reason, the frogs can't walk on water. I'm going to fix that in the reprint, but anyway, they can only step on lily pads, so their obstacles are the water. And it's not just the water, it's also what people do to the water. Um, but understanding the obstacles or limitations of the story and the characters within the story can not only help give your players that creative motivation and understanding like what the struggle is, but also, I can't remember what the other thing I was going to say was. Creative motivation. Yeah, also push them towards the end goal if they know their limitations and how they can sneak around it. Cool. So, story, basic gameplay. So, a lot of, as I mentioned before, synonymous story, basic gameplay, but this time we really want to think about what your players are doing. So, the board interaction stuff, the player interaction stuff, what do people do to each other or with each other? Are they picking up tokens? Are they placing it here? Um, yeah. So, what is the goal for your players? Is it high score? Are they collecting points? Um, if it's your pizza game with the pineapple pizza, maybe each time you have a piece of pineapple in your pizza, it reduces your score by two points or something. Yeah, really basic stuff. But if we're getting this stuff nutted out straight away, basic gameplay. That's why basics there. It's not gameplay. It's not everything because gameplay is a scary term sometimes. Um, yeah. And again, what are your players interacting with? Are you playing cards, draw, rolling dice? Um, Deceiving each other, because there are, does anyone want to make a, de a deception based game, like a sort of werewolf or, I didn't bring my example, has anyone heard of Kitsunado? No, it's, it's, a, it's a Melbourne based game, really cool. Um, I was going to bring it today, but it didn't fit in the box. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. And yeah, gameplay limitations, again, that can be not just the, you know, what a lizard can't tra traverse, this can be about how many ha cards you can have in your hand and how much you get to draw per turn. So really trying to get that basic stuff understood um, from the start. So I went through a bit of this before, target audience, it is a little bit of market research, but it can help you understand what kind of game you want to make. If you want to make a game that is really aggressive, like Uno or something, that we are constantly throwing cards at each other, um, get an example, because I keep talking about Uno, Who's, oh, I shouldn't walk too close to that. Who's played Mantis before? Anyone played Mantis? So this one's all about stealing cards from each other. You're trying to build up stacks of cards and you steal cards if they're like the same color. Um, it would be a really aggressive game which a player that might want to sit there and build a little you know, construction in the corner and then do something a bit more impactful, they may not enjoy that sort of game. So a lot of this stuff you work out, I've, well I've found, you work it out during playtesting, um, which I do have a slide on later. Um, because playtesting is a, a whole different beast. Um, who's playtested games before? Let's put that out there. Some of you might have, yeah? Yeah, excellent, yeah. It's fun, isn't it? It's also very scary. <laughs> no, it's fun, it's mostly fun. Um, but yeah, I guess I've got it at the bottom there, because research, target audience, I mean, next slide's about research as well, but research is important because if you're playing your games, you're playing it, um, if you're playtesting it, talk to them. Talk to them what they enjoyed and what they didn't enjoy. Um, and you know, you'll get a vague, better understanding of that. But again, I don't, I don't want to get too much into playtesting play now because there's all sorts of stuff about accepting feedback in certain ways. Um, research. Playing games is research for making games. We can all agree on that, can't we? Yeah, we've already agreed on that. Cool. Um, what makes other games fun? So this is where you're playing a game and every time you feel like, I had fun in this moment, you need to write it down. This is, it's, a re it's a really weird thing to actually do that, but if you're researching a game properly, it's, it's important to note down, like, I enjoyed this aspect, or I didn't really enjoy that aspect, so let's try and maximize this one and minimize that one. But competitive games, sometimes it's hard, there's always a balance. 
because usually one person's enjoyment will reduce someone else's enjoyment. There's always that, but with simple games, yeah, we want to try and be careful with that one. Um, yeah, and this is, this, this is a little bit of a template you can use when you play another game. You can ask these sorts of questions, like how does the game, how does the game teach your rules? Woo! Got it. Um, is it small? Is it big? Um, what do they have in their game? If it's gizmos, do they have marbles? If it's Shadows in the Forest, which I haven't even talked about yet, it uses light and shadow to actually play the game. It's super cool. We probably can't play it today because we've got too much light. But it's there as an example, as an alternative game that uses more than just cards and tokens. Um, and yeah, how do you win the game? So, oh yeah, and I got a couple of pictures. Oh, no, this is the reason why I got these out, because this segues quite nicely into one of the things I really like to talk about in the education approach with kids, um, is because when kids are starting out, it can be very hard to come up with a basic idea, even just an idea of a game, and make it functional, because they have such unbridled creativity. And the way I like to ground that, and this is actually a method that works for us as well, um, because this is my example, um, is to use references. So before I talked about, you know, an artist can't draw a tree if they haven't seen a tree before. So if you're making a game, sometimes it's easier to look at other games that already exist and think, how can I kind of borrow some elements here, borrow some elements there? I'm not saying, plagiarism is bad, guys. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not saying that we should be stealing game ideas. But when you're learning about this stuff, and especially when you're teaching kids, it's really good as a starter to show them a game and let them play these games and build a game idea from that, because not only will they get to start something and not constantly get hitting, hitting a creative wall, um, they'll be learning some of those processes of converting one concept into something of their own. So, dialing back a bit, the example I've got here is Suro and Corridor. Who's played Suro? Yes, one. It's probably one, two. It's probably my favorite game. Um, because it really hits that accessibility at point. Really easy to learn, very quick to play. Um, that's, ooh, that's the board there. It's really pretty. You make nice little paths. Um, and it's done in a really short amount of time. It also has two different ways to play. There's one version where it gets really messy, but it's great. still great fun. Um, the other is Corridor. Who's played Corridor? I think there's any. Oh, good. There's, oh, cool. There's a couple. Um, I really love Corridor because it's also a deceptively simple game. You have two things you can do on your turn. You can either move your pawn one of these spaces or place a wall and you build a maze as you play the game and you're both trying to like make it across to the other side, making mazes. It's great fun. Anyway, the reason why I'm talking about both these games is Frodge was influenced by both these games. The first version of Frodge, you played down the tiles just like in Suro and blocking other people's paths is one of the main concepts in Frodge. And I started, like the version 0.01 .01 of Frodge was strikingly similar to these two games, but through playtesting, through discovering what worked for a frog racing game, I diverted from, away from those uh, far enough that I thought this is no longer stealing ideas, this has been using other games as reference, um, and it became its own game. You don't play the tiles down in Frodge anymore. Um, blocking paths is somewhat similar, but you're not trying to cross to the other side. There is a version of, of the game, though, that you do do that. So I kept that in there as like an alternative rule because it still works. Cool. So I remember what's next. Oh, this is the big one. OK. So um, this one isn't on your little guide sheet. But yeah, you're welcome to take photos if you want. Um, so when teaching it to the kids, and especially when you're trying to, making, make, trying to make it an educational game, where did I put oh, bin off, um, you want the core educational aspect or the educational message to be minimalistic. Because one problem I've seen with a lot of educational games is they go too hard on the learning. I call it forced learning. You pick up the game and it's like, oh yeah, this is educational, isn't it? And I get that a little bit with bin-off. People sort of, I say, it's educational, guys. And I see the eyes sort of switch off or like, the eyes like oh, really? Um, but that's, where, that's why I started with the whole what is fun thing. Because if you're going to make an educational game, uh, who's thinking of making an edu educational game? Before I got too deep into education. Yeah, a couple, excellent. Good, cool. So you really don't want it to be weighted down with the rules. That's why I went on about accessibility. You want it to be easy to get into. Um, you don't want it to be obvious that you're learning. I, I call it covert education, because they'll play the game, and by the end of it, they realize, oh, dang it, you made me learn something. Um, 
but it's been really great. One of the um, one of the favorite examples I like to use with Binoff is you get to take the first turn if you were the person who most recently took out the trash. Uh, and one family friend, his kid would constantly take out the trash so that every time they played Binoff, he would get to go first. Um, and that was a really nice little, you know, yes, it worked. Um, <laughs> Um, and I mean, another aspect is that kid now runs their entire recycling thing in their, in their house because uh, he knows where everything goes. Um, so this has got expansions coming out eventually. It's going to be called bin office if you have struggle, troubles with your bin, o bin items in the office. Um, okay, so I think I've probably covered a lot of this stuff already. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just press on this again. Plagiarism is bad, but when you're learning and you're teaching kids, it's important to let them explore and let them try things. Um, in the last workshop I ran, I got out. What did I get out? Oh, I didn't bring it. Who's played Happy Salmon? No one. Okay, that's fine. Happy Salmon is a hectic game where everyone has a deck of cards and they're yelling th things at each other constantly. It's great fun. Last time I ran it, we w ran it in a library. I think someone, I think that school now hates me. Um, <laughs> no, they're, they're fine. Um, but in the example in that workshop, we got Happy Salmon and said, okay, how can we make this into a game about tigers instead? So each of the cards is like an action, like one of them is called fish bump. So you, you sit there yelling out fish bump, and then when someone else has fish bump, you both fish bump each other. So in our tiger version, it was like, I think it was like claw scratch or something. You had to go, nah, and then, yeah. The kids didn't do the round thing, thankfully. Um, um, but, I mean, that's, that's just an example of how you can try and look at a game that already exists and just start to adapt it into a different version, whether you start from basic swapping words out, swapping art out, um, you can evolve it into changing mechanics, kind of like what I did with Suro and Corridor into Frodge. I looked at those mechanics that I thought were really fun, and I adapted it into a game about racing frogs. Um, cool. So, again, I think I've rambled too much. Cool. So. I'm not going to get into prototyping and production yet. I want to, actually, how are we doing on time? Has anyone got the time? 1.15. 1 1.15, marvelous. That's perfect timing to get in some, who wants to play some games? Yeah. Who wants to play some games? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the kids are better at that one, too. <laughs> well, actually, they're better at that one otherwise. OK, so at your tables or wherever you, I'm walking near the speaker again, um, or wherever you'd like to set up, feel free to grab one of the games we've got down here. Um, have a think about the aspects of fun. So challenge, play interaction, board interaction, all those things that I glossed over very quickly, but they are in your little handouts on the tables. Um, and if you don't have them, I've run out there, but I can go back to that page anyway. Um, so have a play of that with your, with, with your new friends today. Um, and see how, those, see how you could adapt those mechanics in that game that you're playing into the, the concept concepts you were brainstorming before. So whether your game was about sleeping well, or what did we have over here? Soccer with animals. Excellent. Cool. Right. So yeah, so this is, this is the research time. We all get to research. And being game designers, our research is playing games. That's pretty cool. I like telling the kids that. My, I get to sit down and play games for two hours and call it work, guys. <laughs> Um, cool. Okay. Come grab some games. Games. Grab some games. Yeah, Frodge. I've got Frodge right here. I can get another Frodge. So that, that's actually just the expansion. So but it's up to eight players. Join the table. Join the table. Just, I should just keep staring over there. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. No, it's great. I, I, I mean, this is, this is why we do this, because we want to have the conversations. Um, and it, it's one of the things I really love about board gaming. It's always about conversations. It's always about sitting around, talking to people, and interacting. The most kind of genuine form of interaction. You know, you get the faces, you get the hands, you get everything. Cool. So, um, we talked a little bit about, in some of our groups, um, about uh, prototyping and playtesting. Um, I want to get into a little bit of that. I do want to give you guys a chance to make your games, but how are we doing for time? Time check. 154. What I'll do is I'll keep going through the PowerPoint for a little bit, and then maybe we can, ha we can kind of end the session with however much time we've got to finish making the games. Because I'll just talk a bit about um, my approach to prototyping and playtesting, because I think it's really important. And I'm really excited, because I never get to get to this bit during the w workshops with the kids, um, because we're always spending too much time playing games and making their games. Um, 
and I don't want to get them too bogged down in all the kind of, you know, be wary with this when you're making your prototype. Don't fully illustrate your giant dragon construction because it may not make it to the final product of your game. Um, cool, so, playtesting. You've designed your game and you reckon it works. Cool. Um, construct a prototype. Find people to play it with. Gather feedback. Feedback, that's a good one. That's a fun one. We like a bit of feedback. Um, all feedback has a use, but it should never take over your original vision slash idea for the game. So there's an important thing about feedback. We want feedback, right? That's why we play test, because if we're making a game for people, we want people to enjoy it. We don't just want ourselves to enjoy it, because with board games, there's not many single player board games, so you want yourself, you want other people to be able to enjoy it. So we want people to say, I like this aspect about your game. I don't like this aspect about your game. But the really important point here, well there's lots of important points here, so I'll just try and list them off in as orderly fashion as possible. Um, not everyone will give you, well not everyone will be able to give you productive or constructive feedback, um, but everyone will give you their own type of feedback because every person is different, everyone is subjective, everyone has their own point of view. We know this stuff, we know we're all, we're, yeah, we know people are all subjective. And when you sit around the table and everyone says, I like this, this, and didn't like that, that, that comes from an angle, that comes from a viewpoint. It's all influenced by their life, their experiences around games. Um, you get me, I, sure, I've made these games, I teach these with kids, I'll give you a certain perspective of feedback, but that may not be the best kind of feedback that's for your game. So it's all about trying to get, my rule for this is you just want lots of feedback because you want lots of different people to give you a little bit of, little tidbits here and there. This is kind of my suggestion for how to do it because you don't want just one or two people to give it to you, even if they're like really trusted people, you know, even if your mum reads it for you and she, th she reckons it's really good. Um, sure, she may be the most honest person in the world, but you need other people to look at it as well because is your mum the only person that will buy your game? Maybe, but hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully more people will buy your game. Hopefully more people will look at your product and think, I like that and want to invest in it. Um, but in, and as part of that, we do want lots of different feedback. Um, so I'm going to get into the next point here with the nice little inverted commas, mechanics bloat. Who knows what I mean by mechanics bloat? One, two, what, what, what do I mean by mechanics bloat? Um, like a lot of my game designs, they just keep growing and growing and growing and growing, so it becomes, you, your simple game is now too complicated. To the game is very hard to move because it is like a like, giant blob. Um, so this is why I started off when I talked about the four pillars of game dev. I'm not gonna try and scroll back to it now. Um, basic gameplay, we wanna start with the ground level stuff and then we wanna build a functioning house and then we wanna put in little you know, ramparts going out here and a weather vane or something and sort of cool little bits there. We wanna start to make sure the house works. Make sure the house works. Um, and if we take on too much feedback, someone suggested, oh, you could add this card or you could add that or maybe you add the little whirly gig over here. Um, then you get to the mechanics bloat and not only does the game become too hard to learn, it may just end up not being fun. Um, and that really hampers on that accessibility aspect again, um, because obviously if it's too hard to learn because you put too much stuff in it during playtesting, then you lose, and often you'll, yeah, you'll lose the original vision or idea for your game. Um, my Frodge game, you guys played the expansion. The expansion came out about two years after the base game. The base game was just the whirly do uproot, this is gonna make no sense to anyone else, <laughs> but whirly do uproot, tongue snatch, and Forgot my own card. Really do uproot, tongue snatch, and leap. Thank you, leap. Um, those were in the base game. That's the base game of Frog. Super basic. All the stuff to just let you move stuff around. All the expansion cards add extra layers of stuff that were mostly suggested by people during playtesting. And I looked at those and thought, I love these ideas, but I know it works with just this stuff. So I'm going to launch the Kickstarter with that. Kickstarter was successful. Woo! Um, and expansion got funded through future sales of that. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how to fund stuff later because that's the stuff I don't usually talk to the kids about because it's too real. Um, we'll get to that eventually. Um, okay. Oh, and this is the fun one. Play testers are a limited resource. So it's a really odd way of looking at it, but every time someone plays your game, that's, that's it. Like, they're not, gonna, they're not now a useless play tester. They've experienced it in that version. So every future time they play it, their previous experiences will color their view and their approach to it. It's a really odd way of looking at it, but it's, I've, I've play tested games with people multiple times before and they, they constantly reference old things that were part of the game or they'll, they'll assume that mechanic is still a thing 
<coughs> and it gets really messy. So every you want to choose who you play test with it, and when, and you know if you reckon it's really good this time, choose the people who you know are going to give you really good, productive, constructive feedback. Um, <coughs> cool. Um, and this is a bit of a. I've improved on this in my book, which you were, which I'll hand around. People can have a look at later, and if anyone wants to buy it, that'd be great. But I'm not. I'm not a salesperson. Um, this is my little template for when you ask people to play test your game and you want a bit of feedback. Um, you know, it's all about just asking them mostly what fun, what the, the fun parts were, you know, when they were engaged, when they were least engaged, um, what was appealing, all that sort of stuff. Um, cool. So I get into a little bit, yeah, here we go. This is a fun one. So I, talk, I, I referenced this briefly in my little, my little anecdote before, but in the, in the workshops I run, often the kids will start creating these really elaborate assets for their first prototype. And that's, that's great. I love seeing the enthusiasm that they get into it. When you're trying to balance that and you're trying to make your first games and actually make it either profitable or just at least manageable, you want to keep the scope of what you construct small. So this links in with Mechanics Bloat. If you have lots of mechanics, lots of cards, all sorts of cool stuff, that's great. But it, uh, do you need it all in your first prototype of the game, which after that playtest, it all gets shaved off because it doesn't work anymore. And then you've spent all that time making all that stuff, which maybe you enjoyed making it. That's great. I also like enjoy, I also enjoy making lots of assets for my prototypes. Um, but you'll end up using a lot of time, which could have been spent just getting a quick version of the game done, playtesting that, and getting those core mechanics, that, that foundation of your house, really strong and structured. Cool. So I'll talk a little bit about to the masses. Um, that was a nice little photo of a couple of friends the night before the Kickstarter ended. Um, it was already fu successfully funded there, so we had Sanchuros. Um, so be proud of what you achieved. So this is a bit, who, who's, who's finished making a game here? Who's actually launched something? Yeah, yeah, cool, a couple of hands. Um, it's important to be proud of that. This is, this is my nice little like motivational kick part. You know, be, be motivated, be proud. It's really hard to make a game. It took me a very long time to get anything off the ground. It's why bounty, my little Bounty Burglars ga game down there frustrates me a bit because I kept trying to make it work and I could never do it. So I took a break and made Frodge. Um, and then I could make something. But anyway, this is not about me. This is about being proud of what you achieved. And part of that will help to bring people to you to help support your game. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they, they flock to your confidence, that sort of thing. Um, if you're trying to promote it online, I won't talk too much about this sort of stuff because this is the stuff I don't get into with the kids. It's the sort of, you know, if you're really trying to get it out there. Um, but you want to try and be active on social media if you're going for that um, or in your local community. That's probably more important for board games. If you meet people at events or your local community group or that sort of stuff, um, you can often bring your board games there and play test it with them or just show your new game. And it's a great way of, it's just being social. That's cool. You get to be social and make a game. Um, be friendly and fun. Cool. Um, I'll talk briefly about this one. This is, this is the little mushy bit, but um, my Kickstarter was very much predominantly supported by friends I'd made along the way, um, which was really cute and I, I like that. Um, but they're the people who will support you first. Um, so maybe this is a bit more of a motivational thing about living your life well. <laughs> if you want to make cool stuff, make cool friends who will want to support you in that. And that's a bit of a, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a give and take thing because if they want to make creative stuff too, you can work with them to create that as well. Um, and then you just end up making all this cool stuff together. And now I sound like too much like a motivational speaker. Um, okay, now time for the reality check. I think it's a good time for reality check. Making games is risky. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. It's very creatively draining. It's very emotionally draining sometimes. Um, there are many aspects to manage. If you can do all of those, that's great. If you can do one, that's also great, but that means you'll need to find money to pay other people to do it. Um, all the time to teach yourself. Um, yeah, so you need all those things at the top. Um, obviously, it costs money and time, and you'll have to be able to find those somewhere. I'm not going to talk, talk about funding options and all that sort of stuff. That's not what I teach in the games stuff. I want, in my workshops, I want to focus on just people starting something and getting it out there. Um, 
and having backup plans. So I was chatting a bit before, game dev is not my main career. It's one of my careers. I, I help fund that through other things um, because I like to do it as, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a hobby because I've got lots of games out and I do this quite a bit, but you know, it's, it's important to, I guess, take that reality check and enjoy it for what it is, but always know that not many people are able to make a full living out of game dev, out of creating games. Some people do. Some people become wonderfully successful and that's their main revenue stream. Just make sure you have backup plans and you're ready in case it doesn't become your main revenue stream. Um, it'd be cool if it was my rev main revenue stream, but I also like doing lots of other things, as I mentioned in the earlier slide. Um, I also mentioned I'm trying to get into voiceover as well, because as you can probably tell, I like making funny sounds with my mouth. Um, all right, where do we do it? Oh yeah, here we go. We had the reality check, now we have the good reality check. Why do we do it? Because it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's, it's fun to make games, it's fun to play games. Um, we can be creative. We can express ourselves. Um, I care a lot about recycling and sustainability. So I made the, re the, the recycling sustainability bin-off game, which is actually over there. I keep, oh wait, I don't know where it's gone. Anyway, um, we can entertain our friends because we like making each other laugh, right? We like telling funny jokes. Um, make cool stuff with cool people. And this is one I, I is quite close to my heart and I think is really important. Be creators and not just consumers. And it's something really important that I like to tell the kids as well because it's really easy to fall into the trap of just consuming things, being surrounded by all this media, but never actually creating anything at the same time. Media is creative content and it can teach us stuff and help us find new ways to do stuff. And we are complex, intelligent, powerful beings that can do amazing things with our minds. So let us be more creators and not just, well, I wouldn't say garbage bins and just constantly eating, consuming stuff. Um, but I think it's, it's really important and it does get you know, your mind active, it gets you thinking creative, cr critically. Um, yeah, I'm talking like that's the last slide, it might be. Oh, it was, okay. Um, so yes, go out there and be a creator. Um, and if you would like to connect with me, that would be, yeah, that'd be cool. I like to chat about this stuff. Um, I keep not very active on most of those things. I try to because I do too much stuff. Um, and I think I, oh good, I did. Um, just a little plug, this is my workshop format. So if you'd like me to come in and give a workshop to either your school or your kids, or I have run birthday parties on board games workshops, board games design before, it was great fun. Um, they gave me free pizza. <laughs> um, but I do three different formats. Um, it can be a quick showcase where I just go through some of the basic, basics and we have a couple of games to try out. Um, we can do the workshop like what we did today. Um, Usually we spend more time making the game today, but I wanted to go through a few other aspects because it's because we're all game devs here and we're a bit more serious. Um, and also there's the series one where I do three different days. Um, that's super flexible. The last one I did was fortnightly. Um, and that worked great, except sometimes the kids forget what happens between the sessions. But by the end, they all had super cool stuff. That was the one where they were trying to make the, the big fancy dragon. I unfortunately forgot to bring it. Oh wait, maybe I did. Oh, I did bring it. Marvelous. This is the boss that I told them to make. Initially, they were stitching stuff together and they were using all the resources. And I told them, now, when you play test your game, what happens if you don't need the boss anymore? And they were like, oh, we'll just make another one. It's like, well, you've spent the entire class making this big boss. So as next class, you're going to make another big boss that will actually work. So, I mean, this is part of the, I guess, the inquiry-based learning, which I haven't talked enough about because a lot of game dev is about asking, a lot of teaching game dev to kids is a lot about asking the, them the questions, which sometimes will seem obvious, but when you're deep in that creative zone, they won't be thinking of those questions. And we all do that. We all get stuck in that creative zone where as soon as we show somebody else, they'll be like, how does this work? Why, why is that there? And you'll think it has a purpose, but actually when you're play testing, it loses its purpose quite quickly. Um, cool, yeah, it's, it's, I think it had like Pokemon cookies in it or something. Anyway, cool. Um, so I think for the, for the remainder of the session, well, actually, firstly, are there any questions in general? I've, I've thrown a lot of stuff and I'm very happy to chat with you afterwards. Just, just, uh, sorry. Mm. Sorry. Oh, sure. Oh, you can sit there. That's fine. Oh, okay. Uh, Jay, thanks for all that. Um, do you have any difficulty fitting um, your game development ideas in with, say, curriculum or 
you know, is, is there is there a, an easy slot for you to say, come, uh, come and do a ga game workshop with children? Is it already there or is it, or do you have to sort of um, only do it for special need, uh, special classes, that sort of thing? Yeah, so it's definitely, it's a challenge to fit it into the curriculum at the moment. That's why, like, I guess near the start, I was talking a bit about how um, making games can be, well, I mean, some assignments, people will, the kids will make games as part of their assignment. They'll be told, you make a board game for this. Um, game design as itself as like a, a learning field, um, I'm not sure how much space it has in the curriculum at the moment. Most of my workshops I've run with schools, no, sorry, all of them have been as part of like a special program either with gifted and talented or special needs or all sorts of extra, like essentially um, extension programs of all sorts. Um, I would like it to be more in the curriculum. I'm not sure whether it needs as much of a space as like maths or science, um, but ultimately it can be inserted in any classroom because it's, it's language, it's design, it's creativity, and every subject taps into all of that anyway. It's like if you do a science class and someone says, oh no, you don't need to learn how to spell that. It's like, no, 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 you do. So you're tapping into English there. Um, so science should be everything, or, yeah, anyway. So as just a second <laughs> question along the similar lines is, um, do you find any sort of level at which you pitch that is uh, not appropriate to children of that age? Maybe they need to have abstract thinking or not, that, you know, what I mean is, do they have to be a certain developmental level for the types of games you do? Um, I've found it's quite flexible, actually, because of the, the reference stance I take. So they play games and then try and develop a game that's... Similar. Yeah, that's mechanically similar. That's rel I've found it relatively easy for a lot of abilities to pick up. Um, I usually run the workshops for 8 to 12s, and every time I've run a workshop, 9 out of 10 kids will come back with a game, um, or at least a very basic concept. Um, usually it's, it's that inquiry-based learning thing. You, you ask them the questions, and they're usually pretty good at answering them. Um, it's just about asking the right questions, uh, and this sort of stuff is, it's getting there. It's getting there. So. Anybody else? Oh, just fine. I, that was, I was having a laugh, not laugh, but at your question then, because I was actually thinking the exact opposite about are you in touch with government or working um, with the Department of Education to pitch at this is catering for the future job skills required. You mentioned critical thinking, problem solving, um, the, all the, the skills that we're not going to learn through those traditional subjects and all the skills we need to drive the AI future workforce. So you actually got a program that's catering for what's is actually going to be needed. So yeah, you could uh, sort of flip your pitch a little and uh, yeah, and, and also too, when teachers, schools are so terrified at the moment of, of AI, mm. telling kids the answers. I mean, this is a beautiful example of that creative, obviously creative, creativity is the underlying of all, the, all of this week and, and beyond. But yeah, no, I think it's a, a great opportunity for education to, they're going to have to rethink how they do it. So, you know, you could be able to hit it big, Jake. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, yeah, and it's, um, Definitely, I obviously support from government that sort of space would be excellent. Um, I will mention Binoff did get some support from government. It was partially funded by my local MP. Uh, Christine Tonkin, absolutely lovely lady. Um, she helped with the funding for this. Because I do print all this stuff locally, it's not cheap to produce um, with recycled material as well. Um, so that was only really made possible by that support. Um, and obviously I could do even more if I had greater support. Um, as I mentioned, I have lots of other jobs that help fund this. Um, she employed me for a bit, and that helped fund Frodge expansion. <laughs> so, in a sense, government helped sponsor that. But um, yeah, it would be great to see more support for not only the funding side, but also just the concepts of getting this stuff into schools and ticking all those problem solving, creative thinking, critical, critical analysis, all that sort of wonderful stuff that they keep talking about and how they want this to happen. Um, and game design does it all already. It, it does it by default. Games for education, yeah, yeah, games for education. Aha, that's we come full circle. That's the name of the thing. Um, anyone else? Oh, Mike over here. Um, ooh. Uh, some concepts you might find like, you know, are a bit more advanced, you know, you might need 
higher year levels or whatever might be learning more advanced concepts. How do you find an intermediary between like actually educating them on said concepts and you know keeping it fun and you know entertaining as a game? Yeah, um, it's, it's the because yeah, you don't want it to become unfun because we're talking about games here. And as soon as you start to get to yeah um, yeah to answer your question, uh, it's a challenge. Um, but I really try and focus on play games as research and have a think about what you find fun and then start to make an experience out of it. Because if they've seen games that already exist, they've see, seen something that can do it, um, they have a reference point, they get like a wireframe or a skeleton or something they can trace, and then they get to trace that. And I mean, kids, they do coloring in sheets, they do dot to dot, all that stuff is a loosely similar concept to looking at a game and seeing how they can re redesign that as something else. Um, it sounds complex, and maybe I'm just not wording it appropriately, but um, I've found so far, if pretty much every kid I've shown will get it from that aspect. Sometimes it is a bit challenging and they might disengage a bit, but then they just play a few more games, and then by the end of it they'll still have approached something. Um, it's, it's a hurdle we have to get over, and that's part of that whole yeah, wrong way. Be creators and not just consumers, because the kids are very used to being that consumer, because that's what they keep getting shown. Just consume this, consume that, watch this random video over and over again or something, and not create anything from that. Um, so, but I think there's there's it's it's positive. I might be going too too negative here, but I think there's definitely there's definitely change on the horizon. Cool. Who else over there? Um, Oh, I can. Oh, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> um, th thanks for for the session, by the way. Um, so you said something before about um, looking at games and being critical. Mm. So um, can you elaborate on that? Like, what what, what are you what are you looking for? Because um, like we, we did that. We one of the games we looked at, and we quickly saw that the boys kind of lost interest very quickly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So are you saying that? Kind of look at what you enjoy in the game, what you don't enjoy in the game? A lot of it ties back to what is fun. Because yeah. um, it's that thing that we say, it's hard to define, but when you're try trying to talk about a game itself, it, I've found that you can, you can break it down into these little aspects. Uh, and as soon as people start to disengage, you can look at that and try and ask them, like, why did you disengage at that point? There's a little bit of vagueness, vagity, vagueness here, because sometimes that's because something else grabbed their attention more. Um, but yeah, you know, the phone went ding or something. Um, but that's probably not not in my department. That's, <laughs> that's um, but yeah, it is hard. It is hard to look at games create critically, um, and I try and boil it down to the what is fun, also the the four pillars. So those, I guess, those are my main two. I think it was target audience was probably not them. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, sometimes, sometimes that's it. If people start to disengage from your game, you might, the, the, the takeaway is that that's not your target audience because they're not remaining engaged. Um, it can also be, okay, now, now you need to try harder to engage them because what engaged them instead of your game, how do you then make your game more like that thing that engaged them? So, you know, it's really trying to, I guess sometimes you're playing catch up with the with the the research, um, but when you play test something, you never really know what's going to happen. You, it's very hard to know every because I mean that's that thing I mentioned before. Everyone comes in with their own perspective, their own subjective view of that thing that you've created, and you created it with your own subjective view, which you think that people are going to like or they're going to do this and that, but they do something completely different. It's I mean who's I mentioned D and D before. Who's played D and D? Who's who's been a dungeon master as a DM? Who's been a DM? Yeah. They never follow the path, right? Never. They, it's playtesting. D&D is almost always playtesting because you set up a path for them and they go that way or they go that way or they go that way somehow. How did they fly? I don't know. It, it makes sense, made sense at the time. Um, but it's the same as playtesting because you never know what your players are going to do. But also that's why it's so much fun because you never know what's going to happen and it keeps it interesting, fresh, new, exciting. I love books. I love reading books, but you kind of know what's going to happen in a book. Again, I shouldn't talk books down. I love books. I'm also trying to write books. Um, everyone has their own way of interpreting a book. They see different things by reading the words. Um, with a game, it has a lot of other aspects going on at the same time that people can interact with and change as they play it. Um, 
I want to give a really an example here, but the only one I can think of at the moment is, no, I've forgotten. Oh, Minecraft, yeah. Minecraft is a game that you can, that the players will put a lot into. They're given a sandbox that they can create and evolve, and it creates, not only within the game world, it creates communities outside of that that will constantly change and shift, which other media does as well, but maybe I'm just rambling here. I think I'm just rambling. I don't know, games are exciting. We can all, all agree on that. All right. <laughs> So um, on, on the sort of playtest and, and, and feedback sort of thing, hmm. how do you turn that vague feedback into like actionable things for your game? Oof. Um, it depends on a lot of aspects, I think. Um, on the, oh, I need to think of an example here. Um, I guess if... Oh, it's a hard question, that, because really trying to figure out what needs to be fixed with a game depends on the game itself. Um, and I guess with... I'm trying to think of one of my games as an example. Um, I guess with Binoff, I really tried to focus on the educational aspect and made sure that was there. Because that was kind of my... like I knew what it want, I wanted to achieve with it, so I wanted to make sure that the education was there but it doesn't skimp on the fun. So I started with the education, went to the fun, and then so, oh. yeah, it's hard, it's hard. It depends, on the, it, it depends on the kind of feedback that's given and the situation of the, yeah, there's just so many, there's so many layers and aspects to that. So, yeah, sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. <laughs> but um, yeah, play testing is hard. That's, that's always the thing. Um, and conversations and really trying to get, understand what people are saying is important. Yeah, that was a terrible answer, sorry. <laughs> oh. You didn't need that answer, but everyone would be really rich. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's the thing, yeah. It's, it is very, because yeah, every game is different and it will change so much from the start to finish. Um, because yeah, we are, like creating games is creating worlds. We create entire worlds and experiences that can go in so many different directions depending on so many different aspects. So it is really hard to boil it all down. Um, I mean, I've, I've attempted to with my four pillars and my, my what is fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I, again, this, this, this format, this structure may not work for everybody. And for some of the kids, it helps sometimes. The first two are really important for the kids, especially story. That really, because that whole creative motivation thing I talked about before, super important. If, you care, if your players don't care about the game they're playing because they don't really get into the story, um, even if you don't think there is a story, then they're not really going to enjoy the game. If there is a story and they really know what they're playing as, they know what they're fighting for, then, yeah. Anyway. Oh, we got another one? Just one quick, quick question. What is the hardest thing? Is, is prototyping the hardest part or what? Um, yes. I think, well, playtesting. I think playtesting would be the hardest. Starting off, is, I found it's really hard to start off from scratch. That's why I use the, the reference-based thing. Like, I pick games that I like the certain aspects of, and I, like, build them into that. Um, but as soon as you start playtesting it, that's the part where things can change so much, and you never know why so they're changing. Is this playtesting um, part of the proto prototyping process? Is that, what, is that what you're saying? Oh, playtesting is part of the prototyping, yeah. Right, okay. Like, creating the first prototype is a challenge, because you have to figure out all the, how all the bits will come together. Um, but um, yeah, as soon as you show it to people, cracks always emerge. There's always going to be cracks. There's always cracks. I mean, even in the games that I say are fully launched, like Froge and Binoff, there are cracks in those. There will always be cracks. Because you, again, you're building worlds, and the world has tectonic plates that make earthquakes. So there will always be cracks in it. So there you go. There's a nice little analogy, <laughs> I think. Did that answer the question? I don't know. The <laughs> reason I ask is um, in teaching user interfa interaction design, you're developing a product, right? Or mm. you're designing for a product. And the prototyping with bits of paper and stuff like that, getting people to do that practical uh, part is the hardest. Um, they find it really hard. Mm. The students find it really hard. They don't want to do it. Um, and. Um, to, to find customers to test it with, like in a supermarket or whatever, is hard. Um, so I had that perspective, and I was just wondering, you know, how you get 
children to get e into it easily without all those problems. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's good. That's a good perspective. So um, I, I wrote friends in a lot. <laughs> so finding people to play your games, you, you try and... But also it's about making the game, make sure, making sure the game looks like it will be fun. Um, I'll quickly get out. So Bounty Burg was, yeah, as I mentioned, this is my weird sci-fi baby. Um, but I've really gone a little bit hard on some of the art. I've had a lot of time to work on this game, so you know, that's, that's cheating a bit, but um, I've made sure that it looks like there's a lot of potential. There, yeah, it looks like it could function. Um, I talk about new, potentially new mechanics. Oh, I keep doing that. Um, uh, and I guess, actually this will tie right nice back into the story. If you understand your story from the start, it's quite easy to motivate people to at least try the game. Because um, not only if the game's finished, it'll help them get that creative motivation to play the game and finish it. If it's in the prototyping stages and they have no idea what they're playing as, what their story is, um, then I guess it's like showing, it's like trying to pitch your, it's trying to, like trying to pitch your story idea or book idea to somebody. If your pitch, your paragraph pitch is dodgy, they're not gonna read 200 pages, are they? So if your paragraph pitch or your sentence pitch of your game is dodgy, they're not going to want to play for two hours, play a broken game for two hours, are they? Um, and if, I mean, I talk about, about this in the book, but I haven't put in the, the thing. Um, and I just forgot what it was. Uh, pitch, pitch, pitch. Um, play testers. No, it's all right, it's gone. I'll remember it when we're walking down the street. But yeah, p pitching to people is important. We all know that, yeah. It'll be in the book. <laughs> cool, um, how are we doing for time? Do we have time to sit there and make games? Or? It's always in about time. Cool, oh, well um, thank you very much everyone for coming down and listening. As, as I mentioned, it's the first time I've given it to big kids before. Um, it was very exciting. I hope I didn't talk down to you too much. but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for listening and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, and yeah, thank you to the team at the WA Games Week for this opportunity as well. Um, it's great to see this kind of support for local game devs, um, which we do, you know, WA, WA has an excellent games, games industry. Um, we are isolated in our little corner of the world, so that means we have excellent, unique ideas that need to see the world. Woo! Motivational speeches. Woo! Thank, <laughs> right, thank you so much. That was actually really cool. Um, I know even I personally was very lucky. I was addicted to The Sims, and instead of grounding me, my dad, who is behind the live stream, uh, he bought me a book on how to code and kind of held time on The Sims Ransom for learning how to code, and that's how I got into games. Um, yeah, it, it's really cool way to like change the way you think about things and it helps in so many ways outside of just making games as well like understanding your audience understanding who you're dealing with all the time it's very cool so thank you very much thank you <laughs> we're just about to um make a poll uh live on the slido so if you haven't joined the slido and you're in the crowd there is a qr code at the front um and if you're online it's probably right in front of you um, just to get some feedback, that would be amazing, and, oh, there you go. Ah, oh, I'll get out of the way. I will turn on the poll as soon as I walk out of frame right now. All right, thank you so much, everyone, and we'll be back at 4 o'clock Perth time um, for Life of an Indie Dev with Michael Pierce. Thanks. Thanks.